All right, we're going to start out our section on genetics here with DNA replication first. There are a number of enzymes that are going to be part of DNA replication. And in terms of prokaryotic DNA replication, I'm first going to talk about what happens at the replication fork. I have some other videos up there, up on Blackboard to show you a little bit of about the difference between prokaryotic and eukaryotic DNA replication. Mainly the big sticking point there is prokaryotic genomes are circular, whereas eukaryotic genomes are linear. And so there's a little bit difference in how DNA replication ends between prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms. A lot of what I'm going to talk about should already sound familiar to you. Hopefully it's a review from either 1510 or 1410. All right, I'm going to talk about some of the enzymes, what's going to happen. In terms of that, what we've got um, essentially when we are replicating the DNA, we want to make a photocopy. All right, and the photocopier enzymes that we have are going to be DNA polymerase. Poly yeah, polymerase. All right. There's going to be DNA polymerase 3 that I want you to know. There's DNA polymerase 1 as well. All right. DNA polymerase 3, this is your main photocopying enzyme. This is the um, enzyme that's going to make a copy of the DNA. The thing about DNA polymerase 3, it needs to have something to start with. It can't just start making a copy from nothing. All right. DNA polymerase 1 is going to um, come in kind of at the end. DNA polymerase 1 is actually what removes the RNA that's put down and replaces it with DNA. Okay. There's also a DNA polymerase 2. I'm not so concerned that you know about that one. No DNA polymerase 3, DNA polymerase 1. All right. Another enzyme that I need you to know um, that's really going to start this process is going to be the helicase. All right. And I'm going to draw the helicase kind of right here as a triangle. What the helicase does, that is a protein that melts the hydrogen bonds between the nucleotides that are being held together in that DNA double helix. So the helicase is going to be what op opens up our replication fork. Because what I have drawn here is our replication fork. We have to separate those two strands of DNA so that we can make a copy. All right? And in terms of whether we're talking about eukaryotic or prokaryotic DNA replication, both are what's known as semi-conservative. You're going to have one original parental strand, which is what I've drawn in blue. I'm going to use a different color to draw the new strand of DNA. Okay? But we've got the helicase here. That's going to be important in opening up the um, DNA double helix. We also have a topoisomerase. All right. And I'm going to kind of draw the topoisomerase up here. I'm just going to abbreviate that topo for now. What the topoisomerase does, all right. Because prokaryotic DNA replication occurs circularly, so you're going to have replication, essentially the formation of a replication bubble. You're going to go in both directions. If you're opening up that double helix, what it does is it creates torsional strain on the DNA molecule. So what topoisomerase does is it kind of makes little nicks in the DNA so that can unwind so that you don't get torsion, you don't get twisting that happens as that replication fork is opening. All right. And if you're taking microbiology lab, novobiosin is an antibiotic that you're going to work with in the lab. Novobiosin inhibits topoisomerases. That's how it interferes with bacterial growth. It's an antibiotic. 
it interferes with bacterial growth because it's interfering with this DNA replication process. All right. Essentially what happens if topoisomerase is not active, that DNA molecule, that circular genome, is going to get all twisted up. All of the proteins that are needed in order to replicate aren't going to be able to get in. You're not going to get DNA replication to happen. All right. So that's how an, an example of how antibiotics can hit kind of some basic cellular processes. And this is why we want you to understand how these basic processes work. Because that's how some drugs are going to target bacteria. All right. So we've got topoisomerase. We've got our DNA polymerase. Um, we are also going to have an RNA primase that's going to become important. And we're also going to have, in terms of enzymes that will be important, we'll have a ligase that's going to come in. All right. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to start drawing in how this DNA replication is going to happen. All right. And I'm going to use the pink here. This represents our RNA primer. <coughs> so we need that RNA primase to come in, set down a little template. Then what that does is that opens up our DNA polymerase 3 to come in and now start synthesizing a new strand of DNA. So I'm going to draw the new strand here kind of in orange, all right? And one of the key things associated with DNA polymerase, oh, that's a terrible arrow. Now I've just made it a smudge. All right. So one of the things is it only goes in a 5 prime to 3 prime direction. All right. And if you've noticed, I've labeled my parental strands or my template strands here. We've got the 3 prime end here, which means we're going to start with a 5 prime end here. All right. That fact that DNA polymerase 3 only goes in a 3 prime to 5 prime direction is going to create a little bit of an issue here on this other strand that I'm going to get to. All right. So if we have hypothetically as our sequence, and I'm just going to fill one in here. This is nonsensical. All right. What's going to happen, that DNA polymerase is going to read the template strand. And it is going to insert the complementary base. All right. And in terms of DNA polymerase 3, it's fairly accurate as far as reading those bases. All right. It does have a little bit of um, excision repair possibilities. Wherein, if one of these matches ends up being incorrect, DNA polymerase can go back, take that out, fix it. But it's not 100%. And that DNA polymerase not being at 100% is one way that we can end up with mutations. Okay? Because if it misses, say, a matching here, and even though we've got a T, it puts in a C. All right? That creates a change in our DNA or in the bacterial's DNA. Okay? And that mutation can be lethal for the bacteria or it could have no effect. All right? But in terms of that, I'm going to talk a little bit more in detail about mutations here a bit later. For now, we're just going to assume everything puts in the way it should be. All right? And in terms of that, we've got our 5 prime end, our 3 prime end, and in terms of that DNA polymerase, it's going to keep chugging and reading down that DNA molecule. It's going to kind of follow the helicase. All right? So that one strand of DNA is synthesized in one continuous piece. This is our leading strand. Okay? Because things go 5 prime to 3 prime. At the end, we get that um, DNA polymerase 1 that will come in. It will take that RNA out, that RNA primer out, 
and it will replace it with DNA. I'm not going to do that on this diagram here, just for simplicity's sake. But the RNA polymerase is going to come in, remove, RNA polymerase 1 will come in, remove that RNA primer, so that your entire molecule is a DNA molecule. Okay. Our other strand creates a bit more of a technical challenge because we're now running in the opposite direction. Okay? And in terms of that, putting down a 5' prime end, what we're going to have happen, that RNA primase is going to be really busy on this strand because it's going to have to put down multiple primers to get things to go in the correct direction. Okay? Once we've got the primer down, our DNA polymerase 3 can come in. It's going to start reading, and it's going to read and insert that DNA until it hits the next RNA primer. All right? Then we're going to get DNA polymerase down here. It's going to read until it hits the primer. DNA polymerase here. It'll read until it hits the next RNA primer. Um, so in terms of that, what we've got is now called the lagging strand. That lagging strand is synthesized in pieces, all right? And in terms of that, the lagging strand, those short bits of DNA, actually have a name. They're called Okazagi fragments. And the Okazaki fragments were named because it was actually a Japanese scientist who describe this process in DNA replication. So those Okazaki fragments are the short pieces of DNA that are present on the lagging strand of DNA. And I just like saying Okazaki. It's one of my favorite words. Um, so those Okazaki fragments are associated with the lagging strand. But because we've got now kind of things synthesized in piecemeal, and we still have our RNA primers in there, Okay, that DNA polymerase 1, oh, I'm running out of colors. Let's make it circular for our DNA polymerase 1. That's going to come in, and what that's going to do now is that's going to erase our RNA primer. So that's going to go away. And what it's going to do is it's going to fill in that bit, bit that was RNA and make it DNA. The problem with DNA polymerase 1 is when it hits that strand that DNA polymerase 3 synthesized, it can't rejoin the sugar phosphate backbone here. So what we have, oh, I don't want to use, let's use blue, all right? And for shapes, let's make it a star, just for fun, so that you can distinguish it. That's where our DNA ligase is going to come in. That's going to be our star. The DNA ligase now can unite that sugar phosphate backbone so that we have a complete strand of DNA with no breaks in it. All right. That DNA ligase and DNA polymerase 3 are going to do the same thing on the lagging strand. It's going to come in. It's going to remove that RNA primer. It'll insert the DNA. The DNA ligase will come in and seal that sugar phosphate backbone. All right. So in terms of DNA replication, these are some of the main enzymes I want you to know. I want, to know. I want you to know their function, where they are on the DNA replication fork, um, and the difference between the leading strand and the lagging strand. All right. So that kind of sums up. That's kind of a brief summary of DNA replication. Again, I have some videos that kind of show in a three-dimensional way 
animated videos that show you how DNA replication is happening, those can sometimes be helpful to watch. All right. Boards, I can only do, um, you know, two-dimensional static drawings like this. All right. But that's DNA replication. If you have any questions, please